Well, good evening, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you so much for coming to hear the story of our bicycle journey from China to Italy tonight. So um, here's a map of our route from China to Italy. But before we dive into that story, I want to tell you briefly how Coco and I met and how we wound up in China and got the crazy idea to bike all the way to Italy. Um, for me, it started uh, when I learned how to ride a bike with, without training wheels and how to use a camera right around the age of eight. Um, and I've loved doing both ever since. And when I was a teenager, I became interested in China when I discovered a book in my high school, in Greeley High School Library. Um, it was a book of ancient Chinese philosophy called the Tao Te Ching. This inspired me to study Chinese in college. And that led to some great opportunities to work, study and travel in China. And so in 2013, I moved from Portland to Kunming, the capital of China's Yunnan province to take a job running a study abroad program for Middlebury College. This is the city of Kunming as seen from the rooftop of my apartment building right at the start of the monsoon season. Home to about 6 million people, Kunming's uh, nickname in China is Chuncheng, which means spring city. Its high altitude and low latitude give it a year round spring like climate. It's here that I began playing with the idea of traveling long distance by bicycle. Every chance I get, every break from school, uh, I would head north to explore places with names that jumped straight out of a fantasy novel, places like Tiger Leaping Gorge and Jade Dragon Snow Mountain. This is a photo of me and my Belgian friend Sander uh, approaching the Baimong Mountain Pass from the Tibetan city of Shangri-La, which is a real place now. The, uh, it, was, it was a fictitious place in a book, but the local government thought it would boost tourism to rename the city after uh, the fictional paradise in the book Lost Horizon. And that's Mount Kawagarbo, standing at 22,000 feet, a holy mountain for Tibetan Buddhists, which has never been summited. So after this week-long trek um, with my friend Sander in the mountains of, of Yunnan, I was completely convinced that a bicycle is the way to see the world. It's just fast enough to get you from one place to the next, but also slow enough that you become intimately acquainted with the land that you travel through. So I began reading everything I could about traveling the world by bicycle. And in a short amount of time, that idea went from being a distant dream to a concrete plan. Back in Kunming, I began preparing to leave China by bicycle on a journey of undetermined time and destination. I had been planning on going solo until I met a girl. <laughs> Uh, Coco came to Italy, uh, uh, Coco came from Italy to Kunming to work and continue studying Chinese. I met her at a party and immediately began trying to impress her with details of the journey I was planning. Three months later, I asked her to come with me. And somehow I convinced her to accept my invitation. Uh, here we are on a training ride in the hills just outside of Kunming. After five months of training, preparing our bikes and equipment and pouring over Google Maps, we were, we were ready, or at least we felt we were like we were. Uh, we decided to follow the Silk Road through Central Asia all the way back to Coco's hometown in the north of Italy. The high mountain passes of Central Asia are only safe to cross in the summertime. And I was wrapping up my contract with Middlebury College at the end of the 2015 school year. So in order to make it through the Pamir Mountains in Tajikistan that summer, we decided to fly to, to the China-Kyrgyzstan border and start biking from there. So we started our journey by packing up our bikes and flying to Kashgar in China's northwest Xinjiang province. This is a public square around the Idka Mosque in Kashgar. Um, in this part of China, most people belong to the Uyghur ethnic group. Uh, Uyghur people speak a language related to Turkish, which can be written in Arabic or Chinese characters. And many of them practice, or most of them practice Islam. From this uh, central square around the mosque, winding alleyways teeming with activity spread out through Kashgar in every direction. Uyghur culture seemed to us to be more similar to Middle Eastern culture than what we typically, typically think of as Chinese culture. Kashgar had some amazing markets selling fruits, livestock, and spices. Although we visited during Ramadan, there were always tons of vendors out on the street. This guy was selling what appeared to be a mountain of meringue. 
And these guys were loading unbaked loaves of bread into a tandoor oven. Uh, this kind of bread is called naan, and it can be found throughout Central Asia. It was a staple of our diet from Xinjiang to Azerbaijan. So the border crossing from China to Kyrgyzstan is through a gap in the mountains called the Torugart Pass. Only motor vehicles are allowed to make the border crossing. So we hired a, dr a driver with a van to take us across. Our van dropped us off here, just over the border at the Tashrabat Caravanserai. A caravanserai is a fortress-like guest house for travelers on the Silk Road. The majority of the stonework of this one dates back to the 15th century, but the site has been used as a refuge for centuries more. Since Tashrabat is a UNESCO World Heritage site and no longer a functioning guest house, we couldn't camp out there. But fortunately, there is a yurt camp right next door where we spent our first night in Kyrgyzstan. When we arrived at the yurt, we saw this little girl playing with two young sheep. At first, she, we thought she was trying to keep them warm with her vest. But she was actually just saddling up, settling them up to take them for a ride. She was probably eager to ride a horse like her father. So from Tashrabat, our bicycle journey began for real. At first, we found the roads in Kyrgyzstan to be a little rough and dusty. But guys like these were hard at work building new roads. We saw a lot of road signs describing the new Silk Road that Kyrgyzstan was building with investment from China. A little road maintenance will be much appreciated in places like this. The road to Songkol, an alpine lake at 10,000 feet. It's a challenging climb, but well worth it for views like these. The climb to Songkol was no challenge though for this bright red Muscovich, an indestructible car from the Soviet era. But many Kyrgyz people still prefer their horse for getting around. and for herding their sheep. At Songkol, we spend a night in a yurt camp where the owner encouraged us to try on traditional Kyrgyz clothing. <laughs> Back on the road, we continued to head north towards Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan. It seemed everywhere we went, we encountered very curious little kids. Some of them wanted to give Coco some fashion advice. And we received countless invitations to drink tea and break bread. This was our first big mountain pass, a dusty dirt road, which we had to share with giant tractor trailers and the occasional horseback rider. We found this great campsite next to a roaring river after we asked a local where we could put our palatka, the Russian word for tent. Nearly everyone in Kyrgyzstan speaks both uh, Kyrgyz and Russian, so a few words of Russian came in very handy. Unfortunately, the first tent we broke, um, the, the first tent we, we brought on the trip uh, broke at uh, kind of a junction of the poles. It was very difficult to repair. Um, but fortunately, it was uh, a tent from L.L. Bean, our hometown outdoor outfitter. And uh, when they heard about our problem, they shipped a replacement tent to our hostel in Bishkek. It's a good thing, too, because our hostel was really more of a tent village in the backyard of a Canadian and Bulgarian couple's home. Um, here we met bicycle tourists from all around the world. We spent a about a week in Bishkek getting our visas for Tajikistan, fixing up our bikes, and eating as many cheeseburgers as we could find. So with our Tajikistan visas and our passports, we headed south from Bishkek through the western side of Kyrgyzstan. Heading south from Bishkek, we found ourselves in the mountains again. We often pass kids selling things outside their yurts by the side of the road. But instead of lemonade stands, they were selling kumis, a mildly alcoholic drink made from fermented horse milk. This guy was rocking a 50 cent and G unit tank top. 
And this guy brought out his baby brother to meet us. Over the whole trip, we had very few mechanical problems with our bikes, but would occasionally have to stop and make a few adjustments like truing a wobbly wheel. At 10,000 feet above sea level, it would get pretty hot under the midday sun. So occasionally we would retreat to the shade beneath bridges over cool mountain streams for a rest. In the summer, the nomadic Kyrgyz families bring their herds up to the high mountain grasslands to graze on the sweet summer grass and escape the heat of the lower altitudes. They also use the time to kick back and enjoy the beautiful world around them. These guys invited us to join their picnic on the grasslands. It's consisted of boiled mutton and beer. These high altitude grasslands made for some of our favorite camping spots. Stepping out of the tent at night revealed a dazzling display in the sky. Unfortunately, we couldn't stay in this alpine paradise forever. After we reached the Alabel Pass, we began an epic descent into a completely different environment. After a beautiful 40 mile cruise downhill, we found ourselves in the hot and dry Toftagol region. Those lines across the hill are tracks from goats and sheep who ate everything green in sight. Another shout out to El being here, showing how hot it was once we got down to sea level or close to it. But we still found families and kids making a go of it. Um, when we, the older boy here saw us on our bicycles, he waved us down and, and asked for our help patching a flat tire in his bicycle, which we were happy to do. And fortunately that night we found a beautiful river to camp by. In Osh, Kyrgyzstan's second biggest city, there remain some large reminders of the Soviet past, like this giant statue of Lenin. South of Osh, we discovered a more pastoral countryside where farmers baled hay on permanent settlements rather than nomadically gazing their, uh, grazing their animals. These guys let us camp out in their apricot orchard. And as soon as we began to, began to set up camp, the local kids came out to investigate. This guy waved us off the road to give us a bag of fresh picked apricots. He's wearing a kelpak, a traditional felt hat very popular in Kyrgyzstan. Here's Coco grinding up yet another mountain pass. We always tried to camp someplace out of sight from the main roads and to get to this secluded campsite, we pushed our bikes up a steep dirt trail for quite some time and thought that we'd be alone up here for the night. Uh, but sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of a car uh, stopping just outside the tent. Um, I, this was probably the scariest moment of the, of the trip, but in retrospect, you know, nothing, nothing bad happened to us and we were fine. But when you're in a tent at night and you hear people approaching, you feel pretty vulnerable. Um, but we heard a few men step out of a car and uh, they said something to us first in Kyrgyz and we didn't respond. And uh, then they switched to Russian and they said, Turista da? And I tried to summon up all my courage and not have a wavering, scared voice. And I said, yet, as boldly as I could. And was, so they asked, are you a tourist? And I tried to respond, no. And then they asked uh, at Gouda, which we had learned meant, where are you from? And I was pondering how I should respond to this if, you know, how they would react if I said I was American. Um, but before I could make up my mind about what to answer here, Coco shouted out, Italia! <laughs> and, you know, she was, she was worried. She was scared. I was scared. I wasn't sure what was going to happen next now that they knew that there was a man and a woman sleeping here in this tent. But after a long kind of stressful pause, they said, okay, bye-bye. And they got in their car 
and left. And, you know, it was very scary at the time. Uh, but in retrospect, I think they were probably just curious about what was going on in this tent. We very well may have been camping on their land and they're like, who are these people? Um, and there's a pretty strict division of gender rules in Kyrgyzstan. So having heard a woman in the tent, they probably got a little embarrassed and decided to, to leave. And had it been just me in there, I think they would have probably invited me out to come hang out with them and try to understand what I was all about. So we were incredibly fortunate that this was probably the only really scary thing to happen to us in the entire year long journey we had on the bike. So pushing on from there, we continued heading south towards the Tajikistan border where we were stopped by some highway bandits. <laughs> and luckily this guy came along and rescued us and he forced the bandits to pose for a photo. We crossed the 11,000 foot uh, Taldik mountain pass in a rainstorm and arrived in the village of Saritash, the last town in Kyrgyzstan before the Tajikistan border and the Pamir mountains. We checked into a guest house there and waited for the weather to improve. There's really just two roads in Saritash. The road on the left leads to the Irkishtam pass to China, back to China, and the road on the right leads to Tajikistan. You can see the Pamir mountains across the valley in the distance. After passing a military checkpoint, we began crossing the vast Alay Valley and entered the no man's land between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. But no man's land is really a misnomer though, because um, we found plenty of people living there, including more kids who ran out of their yurts to greet us. This is our first night camping above 13,000 feet once we were in the shade of the mountains, the temperature dropped really fast. We also learned that at high altitude, wa water boils at a lower temperature. So although our cooking water was boiling, our pasta never truly cooked and inst instead turned into a, good, a big gluey mess, which was a true tra tragedy for my Italian companion. Due to the unusually <laughs> high temperatures that summer, a lot of the snowpack in the Pamir Mountains had melted and washed out the roads. Some villages deeper in the mountains had been devastated by landslides and mud flows. We were really starting to feel the effects of the altitude here and it made navigating these dirt roads strewn with rocks quite a challenge. We thought that the building in the distance might be the border checkpoint, but it turned out to be a family's home and guest house. They invited us, invited us in for tea, but after we sat down, it was so hard to get up again that we accepted their offer to spend the night. Hmm. Hmm. Oh. Uh, for dinner, the mother of the house cooked us Marco Polo sheep and noodles for us in a pressure cooker to compensate for the thin atmosphere. The next day, we climbed the switchback roads behind their home to the official border of Tajikistan. After showing our passports and visas to the soldiers at the border checkpoint, we rolled into, to, into Tajikistan's lunar-like landscape. That's a barbed wire fence in the foreground marking the no man's land between Tajikistan and China. Our first in Tajikistan was a village on Karakol Lake, one of the highest alpine lakes in the world. We found a small, we found a guest house in the small village by the lake. We originally planned to stay just one night, but the next day altitude sickness hit us so hard that we decided to stay another day and rest. The ground around the lake is caked with white with salt and there's no commercial activity on the lake or arable land nearby or any land to graze animals. It was really understand to, it was really hard to understand why people lived here but we always found lots of kids playing outside. <laughs> uh, 
We felt better after the second night and continued biking south towards Murgab, the eastern city of the Pamir region. This is right before our climb up the Akbaital Pass, the highest point of our journey at 15,000 feet. At this altitude, every pedal stroke was a struggle. After advancing just a few feet, we would have to stop to catch our breath. You'd think that in such a desolate place, we'd be all alone at the top. But shortly after we arrived at the top of the pass, we were joined by two German cyclists coming up from the other side and two more German backpackers came wandering down from the hills. We encountered some dusty whirlwinds on the road to Murgab. And in Murgab, we stayed at a yurt in the Pamir Hotel while I, re while I recovered from some gastrointestinal distress. Uh, we met a lot of other travelers who had come from the other direction. They said that the lands that landslides had closed a section of the Pamir Highway, which we had been planning to take, and that the only other way through uh, through to the west was through a region called the Wakhan Valley. This concerned us a little bit because parts of Afghanistan are still pretty dangerous for travelers. The X on this map uh, marks the closed portion of the Pamir Highway. Um, south of the blue line is Afghanistan. But we talked to other travelers and did some research and found that the Wakhan Valley is a pretty safe region. It's geographically isolated from Afghanistan and all the other countries around it. It was actually added uh, to Afghanistan as a buffer zone between the Russian and English empires in the 19th century. Um, so it was really our only, other op our only option through the air region. The other option was to turn around and head back. Uh, but after you know, doing the research and, and deciding that it was safe enough, we decided to continue on. And so this is our campsite the next night next to uh, up on the Kargush Pass next to another salty lake. We thought we were pretty tough, but these guys who couldn't have been older than five and nine were out there day in and day out to watch over their herd of cows. These girls brought their baby goat and puppy by our campsite in the morning, which was a pretty great little treat. There are also quite a few mil military checkpoints in the region. The road through the Wakhan Valley was so sandy that sometimes our bikes would get stuck and we'd have to push. We also had to share the road with participants of the Mongol Rally, a road race from London to Ulaanbaatar. We were always on the lookout for fresh water and we're extremely happy when we found a river like this where we could wash up. Extremely high winds sometimes kicked up sandstorms that burned any exposed skin. We took refuge from one sandstorm in this empty stone hut. Finally, we arrived in the oasis town of Longar at the confluence of the Panj and Pamir rivers. The greenery was a welcome change from the sandy desert we had just biked through. Snowmelt rivers give life to the villages of, of the Wakhan, but it also takes it away. Some of the villages we passed through showed signs of devastating flooding in the past. The people of the Wakhan Valley mostly practice Ismaili Islam, a branch of Shiite Islam, and often place skulls of Ibex and Marco Polo sheep around their sacred sites. The Ismaili tradition highly values education for both boys and girls. When we came upon this school group at recess, their teachers immediately gathered them together for a photo. These are the ruins of a Zoroastrian fortress from the fourth century AD. The fields across the river are in Afghanistan. Sometimes the river was so narrow that we could clearly see people on the other side working their fields or leading mule trains. It was like looking into another world. Here's Coco assembling our camp stove for lunch. 
we used a liquid fuel stove that could burn gasoline, so finding uh, fuel was never too difficult. The brown hills in the background lie in Afghanistan, while the snow-capped peaks behind them sit in Pakistan's Hindu Kush. Just like everywhere else we had been on the trip so far, the people of the Wakan Valley were incredibly nice and generous to us. A man who saw us looking for a campsite offered to let us camp out in the house he was building. The main room of a traditional Pamiri house uh, has a skylight made, from, made of four concentric circles, uh, sorry, concentric squares, which represent the four elements. And the roof is supported by five wooden beams representing the five pillars of Islam. In late August, uh, autumn began arriving in the Wakan and brought some beautiful colors to the landscape. Shops and goods were very scarce in the Wakan now. And uh, this was the best toilet paper we could find, which was not the best, not the greatest to use. But this mother and daughter brought us a heaping bowl of fresh yogurt when they discovered us camping in a grove of trees, <laughs> in a grove of trees near their home. And this is Kadam. When we were filling bottles from what we thought was a spring, he told us uh, very politely in great English that it was in fact a gutter. He and his lovely family invited us in for tea and bread and insisted we spend the night. When we arrived in Korog, the capital of the Pamir region, we realized we were running out of time on our Tajik visas and decided to hitch a ride on a Jeep to the capital of Dushanbe. In Dushanbe, we met the legendary Vero, a French woman working for the um, EU who hosts any and all bike packers who come her way. We found her through warmshowers.org, a social network for people who like to travel by bike. We met other travelers from around the world and shared a lot of great stories, information, and meals. From Dushanbe, we continued uh, west through Uzbekistan towards the Caspian Sea. Going into Uzbekistan, we encountered very different uh, landscape and topography that we, from anything we had seen before. Um, we started ex encountering deserts for the first time but some of those deserts had been turned into cotton fields. Uh, during the uh, Soviet era in Uzbekistan, most of the Aral Sea, a huge uh, inland sea, was drained to irrigate these fields. And it's still a really important crop for Uzbekistan today. Uzbekistan was a little more populated than Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan, it was getting harder to find campsites, but we found that uh, orchards like this one made good places to camp. Uzbekistan is also home to some incredible Silk Road cities like Samarkand, the ancient camp capital of the Timurid Empire uh, from the 1400s. Um, this place right here you're seeing is called the Registan, and it's home to some stunning examples of medieval Islamic art. There's a very favorable exchange rate for US dollars to Uzbek Som, but on the black market, you can get twice as, twice as much the official exchange rate. So here we had exchanged maybe, I think it was like 20 or 40 US dollars for what's gotta be hundreds of thousands, if not more Uzbek Som. For an especially long stretch of the desert between Bukhara and Kiva, uh, we hitchhiked with a truck driver but his truck broke down in the middle of the desert and we had to camp out in the trailer. He never did get his truck started again, at least not while we were with him, but another truck stopped to help us and took us to Kiva, uh, yet another beautiful medieval city. From Nukus, we took a train through the desert to Oktau to find a ship to take us across the Caspian Sea. The only other ways west were through Russia or Iran, both of which were impossible due to visa restrictions. 
uh, we met Bak uh, Bakhtiar and Igerim through warmshowers.com and or .org, and they hosted us in Oktau until a ship arrived that could take us across the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan. That ship's main priority, though, was shuttling these railroad cars across the sea, and they shuffled us off the ship onto the port in Baku in the middle of the night. So we crossed the Caspian Sea by a ship and arrived in Baku in Azerbaijan, uh, where we met, we connected with another host uh, through warm showers. And it was a family uh, who was uh, teaching at an international school. And we stayed with them for a few days and it just poured cats and dogs. It was just raining the entire time we were in Baku. And we saw no end in sight to the rain. So we decided to uh, take a train to Tbilisi in Georgia, rather than riding through weeks and weeks of rain. And so Tbilisi was our first taste of kind of more European style uh, culture and architecture. Georgia is also home to a lot of really cool uh, ruins of medieval castles. And by this time, it was about October, so the fall foliage was settling in, and it was really a beautiful region to cycle through. But it was also getting kind of cold and wet. This was the lower floor of a police station that uh, a local policeman uh, let us camp out in. And this is the cave city of Vardzia. It was built in southwestern Georgia in the 13th century as a refuge for monks and nobility fearing attack by the Mongolians from the east. And it's from here that we cross the border into Turkey. Uh, but in Turkey, it was already starting to get very cold. There was a fair amount of snow in the mountains already. But a little further south in Turkey's Kars province, uh, we explored the ruins of the 10th century Armenian kingdom of Ani. In the distance, you can see Mount Ararat in Armenia. Uh, and here's us uh, descending into Cappadocia, famous for its extreme topography and cave dwellings used by early Christian refugees from the Roman Empire. It's also a famous destination for hot air ballooning. So in December was quite cold, so we decided to head south to the Mediterranean coast in search, in search of warmer weather. And we found it. Through the website WorkAway, uh, we found a guy named Kenan who was willing to trade room and board for some farm work. It was nice to be off the road for a little while. Kenan employed a few Syrian refugees at the farm and it was interesting to get to know them even though we didn't share a language. After a week on the farm, we continued along the coast. That December, it was still warm enough to swim in the sea. Turkey's southern coast is littered with uh, Lycian ruins date, dating back to the third century BC. Lycian cult, uh, culture was strongly influenced by the ancient Greeks. Southern Turkey also has some phenomenal roads for cycling and great campsites. This is up on Mount Olympos uh, near, you know, where we were in Southern Turkey. This is a naturally occurring phenomenon called the chimera, where you have natural gas leaking from vents in the cliffside that combust as soon as it hits oxygen. Um, and so we, of course, bought some marshmallows and got some sticks. And this is where Coco roasted her first ever marshmallow. 
And these are some of the more of the kind folks that we met along the way in Turkey. We always say that if we stopped for every cup of tea that was offered to us along the way, we'd still be out there riding our bikes somewhere. We would never would have had time to get home. But unfortunately, we did have to return home eventually. Um, and so from Marmaris in Turkey, we, we began island hopping through the Aegean Sea uh, from Rhodes to Crete and up to Athens. Rhodes had a really beautiful and interesting mix of medieval and ancient Greek architecture. We were starting to find more olive groves as we came into a more Mediterranean climate. Uh, it, here in Crete, so from Rhodes, we took another ferry to Crete, and these are the ruins of the Minoan, uh, Minoan civilization at Knossos, uh, where the mythical Minotaur was said to have lived. More views of the Crete countryside. In Rhodes, we had connected with a cyclist that we had met, met back in Tajikistan and we rode together through Crete. Matala Beach on the south coast of Crete was a large necropolis during the Roman Empire. The caves in the cliff were dug for, to, uh, for tombs of Roman soldiers. And in the 1960s, it came back to life as a hippie colony. And so from Crete, we took another ferry to Athens. And here you see, of course, the famous uh, Acropolis. And here's a look at the Erechtheion with its human shaped pillars. The, er the area around Athens was quite densely populated. So rather than arouse suspicion by creeping around looking for a place to wild camp, we camped out in the open on the portico of this church. So we cycled from Athens to Patras on the west side of the P Peloponnesian Peninsula and made our final sea crossing of the journey to Brindisi in Southern Italy. The olive groves of the Puglia region made great campsites. Puglia is also famous for these unique stone huts called Trullo, which also made for great campsites when they were abandoned. On our way north through Italy, we stopped in Matera, another cave city like Varzia and Cappadocia. We cycled along the Ro uh, we cycled into Rome along the Tiber or Tevere River, and of course, had to stop by for a visit at the Colosseum. This is Perugia in central Italy, uh, a very important city in medie medieval times. Now it's better known for its university and its chocolate. Heading north into Tuscany in the spring brought beautiful rolling green hills and budding wine vineyards. An abandoned farmhouse we camped in, this is an abandoned farmhouse we camped in one night after getting drenched in a rainstorm. Rice and potatoes are a staple of our meals on the road, but since we were in Italy though, this one was seasoned with pancetta. Rolling into Tuscany. Here we're entering the city of Siena through its huge city walls and gate. Cycling through its narrow winding streets. Every year here in the center of Siena, there's a fiercely intense horse race called the Palio di, di Siena where they ride horses in the central square. And here's the Duomo di Siena, or the central cathedral. And then here's some artwork from the Uffizi Art Museum in Florence. And a view of the famous Ponte Vecchio Bridge, also in Florence. Of 
Of course, we had to stop by the Tower of Pisa. And then we started to wrap up our trip in uh, the north of Italy, here in Cinque Terre, a beautiful group of Italian towns along the coast. And as we neared Milan, it started to get quite uh, urban and densely populated and not so nice or um, scenic to bike through. Um, so we decided to take a train for the last stretch of the journey and um, Coco's friends and family all came to meet us at the train station when we arrived in Milan and they rode with us the last few kilometers from the train station to uh, her house. We've got a, a short video clip of that. Well, grazie mille. Thank you for tuning in for uh, this presentation and letting me tell our story to you again. Um, I'll stick around and my my wife Coco is here in case you have any, any questions for her as well. <laughs> um, I guess as an epilogue to that crazy journey, uh, at the end of it, I moved back to Maine and Coco stayed in Italy for a little while and we did the long distance thing for a little while while we kind of figured out what we we're going to do with our lives and immigration and all that stuff and then um finally in the summer of 2019 we we got married and she lives here now and now we live in falmouth the end <laughs> thank you peter <laughs> Um, that's a great ending. Um, why don't you stop? I'm gonna have you stop sharing your screen just so we can see um, your face and Coco's face better. Uh, and then I think we have um, a few questions. Um, I'm gonna, Roberta's here with me too. And I'm gonna pose the first question, which is, hi Coco. <laughs> see the peanut gallery back there <laughs> has a face. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, the first question, well, I'm going to combine a couple questions, um, and that is sort of about the technical aspects of your trip. Um, we have a question about how you, well, you mentioned that you were always on the lookout for water, but one of the questions posed was how you kept enough water with you during the day. Um, how did you, how did you handle that? That's a really good question, and it's something we talked about all the time on the trip. It was always on our minds. Um, you know, first of all, obviously we had water bottles, a lot of water bottles on our bike. We each carried um, at least three, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whenever we'd find a fresh water source, um, we would fill them up there. And when, but we, we spent a lot of time in wilderness where there was no, you know, faucet or store where you could get water. Um, so we had a water filtration device. Um, it's actually called, it's a pretty neat, neat little gadget. It's called a SteriPen. And rather than pumping water through a filter, it's, uh, it uses an ultraviolet light to sterilize the water. Um, so it's just like a little wand and you put it in your water bottle and you swirl it around and it makes it safe to drink. Um, and so, you know, when we would, oh, we were always on the lookout for a river or a stream or a spring where we could fill up our bottles. And if we were, you know, unsure of the source of the water, we would use this device to sterilize it. Um, and then there was a follow-up question from the same person who uh, 
asked, aren't the people you meet along the route some of the best parts of your trip? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, another question um, that we had too was about your photography. Can you um, talk a little bit about your photography, the, how you came to have this expertise and what type of um, equipment you were using and how you managed to keep that equipment safe over the course of a year under, I'm sure, trying conditions? Sure. I mean, I definitely wouldn't call it expertise. I'm not a professional photographer. It's just always been a, a hobby of mine. Um, but I've, I just like cameras and I've, I've play around with them all the time. Um, I've owned a bunch of different kinds throughout my life from, you know, the first little point and shoot camera my parents gave me. It was probably like my dad's old camera when I was eight um, to like film camera I used in college um, in a black and white photography class. Um, I had like a, a cool, a nice like Nikon digital SLR that I used for a lot of my prior trips in China um, but that actually was stolen in a, in a burglary of my apartment in my apartment in Kunming, unfortunately. Um, and so in preparing for this trip, you know, I had to use a lot of different cameras and I knew that I needed a really simple camera that had long battery life um, and just very few moving parts um, and was not likely to get sand in it or, or moisture and, and get destroyed. Um, so I actually have the camera here. Um, I brought this one. This is a uh, digital rangefire style uh, camera from Fuji. It's the X100S and it just has this one lens. You know, it's just a fixed uh, 23 millimeter lens. Um, so it's kind of a good all around lens. It's, it's, a, it's a wide angle. Um, so you're not gonna get any like amazing portraits or wildlife photography wow. with it. Um, well, you can get portraits, but you have to get really close to people. You can't zoom in on things from far away. You have to get right up close and personal, um, which is a good way, I think, to get a portrait anyways, because you can't creep on people from a distance. You actually have to go up and introduce yourself and show that you're a friendly, nice person and make a human connection before you shove a camera in their face. And speaking of meeting people and, and shoving cameras in, in strangers' faces, how did you um, how did you plot out where you were going to be using? And you mentioned a couple times the warmshowers.org, or did you have internet access along the way where you could, um, you know, track people down on the day that you were going through? I'm curious about how you manage the the yeah accommodations. Uh we had, we had a few great hosts through warm showers. Um, that's a really amazing, um, network, uh, for people traveling by cyclists and people who are open to hosting cyclists. It's all free. Um, there's no exchange of money for it. It's just, uh, it's a free economy kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, we would coordinate through warm showers. Um, but that was mostly for, you know, it was mostly used by English speaking peoples of the world. Um, so people who already had kind of like a connection to, you know, the, the, the world at large and interested in cycle touring, like you're, it's not a kind of website you, you would find if you've never thought about traveling by bicycle before. Um, so a lot of the hosts had traveled extensively by bicycle themselves or were dreaming of doing it someday and just wanted to kind of live vicariously through other people. Uh, and yeah, to do that did require uh, an internet connection. So we could only really do it where um, we had, you know, in when we'd arrive in a country, we'd try to buy like a little SIM card for the phone. Um, but, you know, in places like Tajikistan, there's very few places where you get reception anyways. Um, so, and obviously out there, there was really no way to coordinate through the internet for hosting. Um, so the majority of what we were doing was just camping out and occasionally, you know, we would ask somebody where is okay to camp and they would insist we come stay with them. And the other, the other website I mentioned was uh, WorkAway. I think it's workaway.info. Um, that is not cycling specific. That's just a, a website where you can, where travelers and hosts can coordinate and they um, exchange room and board for a little bit of work. 
Um, so we actually did that twice. We did that on the farm in Turkey. Uh, and we also stayed, we didn't mention this in the presentation, but we stayed at a uh, really nice, like small, they called it a boutique hotel uh, on the coast of Turkey um, where the owner wanted, was looking for a caretaker for his place. You know, so he saw our profile picture and decided he trusted us and took off for vacation for a couple of weeks while we just like oversaw his beautiful hotel with no guests in it and just like slept in a big comfy bed and cooked a ton of food in this uh, like commercial grade kitchen. It was pretty sweet. Um, uh, one person um, asked specifically of Coco what your best and worst moments were on the trip. <laughs> Well, I have to say my best moment was at Sanko Lake in Kyrgyzstan when I woke up in the middle of the night and we were sleeping in a yurt and a yurt does not have a floor. So it was grass and we were just sleeping in on, these, on these beds. And then I woke up to the sound of horses that were running down a hill and I got out of the yurt and they were just grazing in front of the yurt with the moonlight shining and it was just the most beautiful memory that I have of the trip really just yeah just incredible and the worst moment it's getting pretty personal. <laughs> <laughs> well, the worst moment, I have to say that we were, there was one time where we were staying in a, in a hostel and a man followed me in the room while Pete was taking a shower. Um, but I was cutting potatoes to prepare dinner because we were cooking with our camping stove in our hostel room. <laughs> So I had a pretty big knife next to me and I immediately asked him to just get out and go away. Um, but, you know, stuff like that happens, unfortunately. But um, yeah, that was the worst moment, really. Anything else that I can, nothing else that I can think of. So we have a, um, a couple of questions about um, if you've, well, one, one question was if you've um, had any relationships that you've kept up with. Um, and a similar question is if you've been back to that, any of those areas um, at all. Um, are we still, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, we still keep in touch a little bit with with some of the people we've met along the way. Just, you know, we're we're Facebook friends or follow each other on Instagram. And so we check in through social media every now and then. Um, both, you know, just random people we met along the way or, or people who hosted us um, and also other cyclists we met along the way. Um, it's not it sounds like a crazy journey, but there were, there were a bunch of people on the road on bikes doing the same thing we were. Um, and most of them seem to, maybe this is just confirmation bias, but most of them seem to be coming from Europe going to Asia. And we were some of the few from Asia going to Europe. So it was great. Every time we crossed paths with each other on the road, we would exchange information. Um, but sometimes, you know, occasionally, we met people who were traveling in the same direction as us. So we would ride together for a while and uh, share stories and connect that way. Um, so we still, we still keep in touch a little bit. Um, but no, we haven't, I, we have not been back to any of these places since then. It would be amazing to go back and, and revisit them when it's, when it's safe to do so. Um, a few questions clearly from a cyclist. Um, how many miles a day did you average? And also wanted to know how much everything weighed fully loaded. Uh, our mileage, we kept it pretty low. Um, I'd say like 20 to 40 miles a day, you know, like in the low tw 20s when the terrain was really, you know, steep when we were doing a lot of climbing um, or in really high altitude places, like we just didn't have the strength to go very far. Um, and we were also not interested in, in trying to race through it all. Our goal was to travel. It wasn't just to bike as fast as we could. We weren't trying to set any speed records. We wanted to 
see the see the world and, and meet the people in it. So we we took our time. And when we would find a place that we liked, we would often just like stay there for a couple of days and, and really soak it all in. Um, but maybe, you know, I think our biggest day we did 80 miles and that was when it was like maybe a, a gentle downhill grade uh, and it was a paved road the whole way. And we had a tailwind and we were just, just smashing the miles and that felt great. Um, but it was through like a desert in Uzbekistan. So we were happy to, to fly through that. And then our bikes were, were really heavy. We never weighed them, um, but they, they weighed a lot. Pete's bike was heavier than my bike. Of course he, he took on a lot of the weight for me, but I couldn't, I couldn't lift it. Not even, not even a tiny bit. <laughs> and Coco had never really done any like major cycling before this, I think before or camping or camping. <laughs> <laughs> The most biking she had done was just like around her hometown, like over to a friend's house or down to the store. And, you know, so I, I had just started getting into like doing long distance biking and doing, you know, 40, 60 long mile days. Um, but she was a really important part of the trip for me and I needed to make sure it was uh, a tolerable experience at the least for her. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's a proverb that says, if you, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's what we chose to do. Nice. Well, one of the comments from the Q and A is that um, they were rooting for the end of your story that you would end up married at the end. So they're very happy with a happy ending story. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you don't have to answer this one, but there is a question. Um, in Italian, somebody asking, why aren't you living in Italy? The pasta is much better there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one other question um, we have is, um, if you've done any other big bike trips since, um, or if you have any planned for the future? We haven't done any big bike trips like that since then. Um, you know, it's, it was kind of a, an adventure in its own, just kind of navigating the whole immigration process and then the wedding and all that kind of stuff. And so we've, we've had our lives full of, of lots of other adventures and living here in Maine, we have a lot of opportunities to get out and go camping and hiking and, and skiing. So we're still, we're still plenty active, but the, the logistics, I mean, the, that trip was kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity because we were both living in China. Uh, so we didn't own anything. We couldn't pack in a, in a suitcase or a backpack. Um, and we could just leave our jobs and our responsibilities in China behind. And so we weren't paying rent. We weren't paying bills. Um, we were totally free. And so, and we lived very, very cheaply. Um, now we've got a mortgage, we've got a dog, great dog, and we're super happy with our situation now. So, I mean, to do an epic year long trip like that um, and, and kind of hold on to your life back home, you have to save up way more money. Whereas if you just like sell everything and cut all your ties, pull up stakes and hit the road, it can be done on a, on a pretty tight budget, which is what we did. So we'd love to go for another bike journey Again, like that, I actually built up a, a bicycle with a giant front basket for our dog. <laughs> um, but but we'll see, we'll see what the future holds. Once once it's safe to travel again, we'll probably the first stop is to get get back to Italy and and see friends and family there. Yes, hope, we all hope that the world allows that for you both soon. Um, we should probably wrap up the questions there. Although I do have one personal burning question and that is, did you bring the marshmallows or were they for sale in Turkey? They were for sale right there. It was kind of an activity to just <laughs> put marshmallows on these chimera flames that were coming out of mountain. So they, they were just selling them right out there. And he asked me, do you want to roast marshmallows? And I was like, I never roasted a marshmallow before. So that happened. Yeah, it was. So I insisted. Was, I insisted. Yes. It's an international treat. Yes. <laughs> Too bad you didn't have graham crackers, I meant to say. <laughs> yeah. No, and they were pretty tiny. It was a little miserable, but it was okay. <laughs>
We fixed that though. We've had plenty of roast marshmallows. Oh here. yes. <laughs> All the s'mores. Well, thank you, thank you both. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Coco, for coming in at the um, for the question and answers too. It was really lovely having you. Um, I this is our last scheduled um, speaker for this round. So if someone out there has an idea um, of a speaker and wants to, us to host them, please um, be in touch and let us know. We do have a one more companion event to um, the Silk Road, uh, you know, this month's Silk Road um, speaker presentation. And that is the one pan pomegranate chicken demo um, featuring spices from the Silk Road. And that's next Thursday at five. We're co-sponsoring that with Now You're Cooking. So um, visit our website um, to find out more details about that. Um, but until then, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Coco. Thank you, everybody out there for tuning in. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great.